My name is Aaron Newcomb. I'm a director of product marketing at Sysdig. Uh, I've been around monitoring for a little while, I uh, about five years, six years. Uh, I spent some time at New Relic, also worked at AppDynamics, and then came over to Sysdig and long enterprise uh, hardware and software background before that with companies like HP and Sun Microsystems, uh, Oracle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but for monitoring, you know, I would say I'm 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 still relatively new, uh, but I have a pretty good background. So I'm going to be talking today about the best practices around selecting, choosing, implementing Prometheus exporters. So let's go ahead and get right started. This is what I'd like to spend some time talking about today. And uh, if you do have questions, happy to take some time to answer those. I'll try to end up uh, with enough time to have a discussion if you'd like, uh, but certainly feel free to throw some questions in and I will try to answer those uh, as soon as I can. So we're gonna be talking about just to level set what's Prometheus and what's an exporter in case there's folks on the call that aren't aware. Um, we'll talk about five Prometheus exporters uh, best practices and then if there's time, I'll do a little demo to show you what it actually looks like, uh, at least with the Sysdig product. And then, as I said, there'll be time for questions as well. So at Sysdig, we like to talk about um, five workloads that we see our customers running in uh, their secure DevOps environment. And secure DevOps is really just um, a trend that we're seeing where uh, security is playing a bigger and bigger role in DevOps teams. And so there's really five things that we see, image scanning, runtime security, compliance, which, hand, which occurs uh, at all stages throughout the, the um, uh, um, application development process, as well as monitoring Kubernetes and containers. And then finally, application and cloud service monitoring. Now this last point is the topic of today's discussion, which is where these best practices come in. And these best practices will apply to any uh, tool or methodology that you choose. Uh, of course, I do work for Sysdig, so I'm gonna be using Sysdig as examples here, um, but you can take this information and use it in your own environment. You don't have to necessarily uh, use Sysdig for any of this, um, but that's what I'm gonna be showing because that's the tool that I happen to have at, at hand. So first of all, what is Prometheus? Well, Prometheus is a project that lives in the CNCF um, that we'll talk about the uh, progression and popularity of Prometheus as a project in a minute, but essentially it's a time series based monitoring system. So it captures uh, metrics from your system um, and stores them for you. And then you can go back and analyze those to see what's going on in your environment. But it's not just that, it's also a set of client libraries. So if you're running your own code and you need a library, you wanna instrument it, you can instrument it with Prometheus um, by using the client libraries for Python or Java or Go, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can do that fairly easily. Um, it's also an ecosystem with exporters for lots of different third-party applications. So if you're not uh, developing your own application, you're using somebody else's, you can find an exporter for it. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, it also exposes metrics in a human readable format so that you can use things like PromQL, the query language for Prometheus, to go in and take a look at those and have them make sense, hopefully, in the way that they're presented to you. It also allows for uh, service discovery mechanisms so that you can more easily find things as they're deployed if you're automating your environment. It's also worth noting that it's the standard way to monitor Kubernetes environments. So if you are deploying your workloads on Kubernetes, <clears throat> the two really go hand in hand. Uh, in, in fact, Prometheus is, depending on how you measure it, the second most popular project at the CNCF behind Kubernetes itself. So, and you can see some of the, uh, um, they call it velocity. This is actually, these stats are taken from a report that the CNCF put out uh, almost a year ago. But, uh, so these trends have continued to go up since then, but it shows the velocity and the way they measure velocity of a particular project is by combining the number of commits, the number of pull requests, the number of issues and the number of authors. And by that they can take a stab at judging the health of the project. And so you can see that 
not only is it the second most popular project, but it's also growing uh, in not only popularity, but also in the number of contributions that are happening in the uh, Prometheus, the various Prometheus projects. There's actually more than one, obviously, if you look at GitHub. Uh, now we also, just to level set again, we need to talk about what is an exporter if you're not familiar. So uh, exporters are for, as I mentioned, third-party applications that don't expose Prometheus metrics natively. There are some applications out there that do, or at least have that option, um, but many of them don't. And it can be difficult for a maintainer of a large project to add uh, Prometheus instrumentation into their project. And so what's happened in the community is the community has come together and said, we're gonna develop these exporters that will allow us to convert the metrics uh, that we're pulling out of a particular application into a format that Prometheus understands so that I can get all those metrics hopefully in one place to better analyze them. Uh, as I mentioned, if you're coding your own application, a bespoke application, you can do direct instrumentation with Prometheus there. So you don't necessarily need an exporter, but uh, for third-party applications, um, in most cases, you will need an exporter in order to get those metrics out of those applications. All right, so let's jump into the five best practices now that we all are on the same page. So the first best practice is finding the right exporter. How do you do that? What's the most efficient way? Uh, understanding the metrics that are coming out of a particular exporter that you choose, uh, being able to set alerts that are significant, enabling your team to use the data that you're pulling when you're using Prometheus exporters, and then also having a plan for scale for Prometheus as you implement exporters. So we'll talk about why all those things are important or why I think they're important. There may be other things that you feel that are added to, the, to this list or should be considered, and if that's the case, uh, go ahead and either put them in the chat or let me know via a question and we can talk about those um, at the end of the presentation. I'd love to hear your thoughts. But let's go ahead and walk through these now. Um, and these are things, again, they're not specific to Sysdig, but I will be using some Sysdig examples as we go through. So uh, where do you find exporters? Generally, finding exporters isn't necessarily the problem. You can do a Google search and find an exporter, but what you may find is uh, that there are multiple exporters. So you do a Google search for uh, AWS CloudWatch, for example, you'll find five or six exporters that have been written over time. The question isn't finding the exporter, it's choosing the right one. Here are some places that you could look to get an indication for which one to choose. There's the, uh, the first link on the page is the Prometheus project documentation itself and they try to capture all of those there. It's a little bit of the kitchen sink model, but you can get a good idea for what exporters are out there. Um, the, another interesting place to check is the uh, this wiki page, which lists the Prometheus default port allocations. And by looking at the, the various ports, the default ports for particular applications, you can find exporters there as well. Um, and since it's on a, a wiki page, you can actually add exporters there over time really easily. Um, another place I'll talk about more is uh, promcat.io. This is a separate website. It is maintained by Sysdig and we have engineers working on this, um, but I'll talk about that. Let's actually just jump in and talk about um, Promcat real quick and I'll go back since we're on the topic. So uh, Promcat, as I mentioned, is a, is a separate website from sysdig.com. It is for the community, but the uh, issue that we're trying to solve with it is that we heard from a lot of customers over time when they go to try to choose an exporter, they are spending way too much time in the maintenance process, the selection process, um, the configuration process, uh, because all of these are, most of these are GitHub projects. Some of them come with better documentation than others. And so what we wanted to do was uh, create a resource for the community that they could go in and find all of those things I just mentioned in one place. So we curate uh, exporters. We try to pick the best one that most of our customers tell us is working and is working well. If it's not working, if it needs a little adjustment or if there's issues that, that uh, perhaps need to be addressed, our developers will actually go in and help that open source project resolve those issues if they can. And then they'll augment the documentation with configuration information and uh, dashboards and alerts. And I'll show you an example of those if there's time at the end. Um, but if you're not using uh, Promcat, how do you know if the exporter that you have is right for your needs? Well, there's a couple of different things that I would recommend looking at. Uh, one is go to the GitHub page, see how many stars it has, 
uh, how many issues it has, how many contributors it has. Uh, just like we mentioned with CNCF, how they do that velocity metric, um, you can use those same indicators to see, is this exporter a good exporter to have? Um, is this uh, a particular exporter led by a company or an individual or hopefully a set of contributors so that everybody is putting in their two cents, so to speak, and working on features that are important to the actual users of that exporter? Uh, how long has the development been going on for? Also, when, you know, has is it still under current development, I guess I would say. Um, uh, Hard-coded deployment specific assumptions, those can be difficult because who, uh, if I'm writing an exporter for, for an application in my environment, then I'm taking my environment into consideration. That may be different than your environment. So it's important to know, is the has this been coded well enough to be flexible for various uh, situations that may occur? Um, and then, of course, is anybody actually looking at the issues? Take a look at the issues page and just see, um, are issues being fixed? Is there discu good discussion happening? Are people uh, uh, posting examples of issues when they happen? What, what's going on, et cetera? So those are some ways that you can try to figure out which exporter might be one that's active and, and worth pursuing in your environment. The next best practice is taking a look at the metrics that are coming out of the exporter and trying to understand how they fit in your environment. One easy way to do that is by taking a look at the project page. Project pages are encouraged by Prometheus, the Prometheus team to be um, explicit in the types of metrics they're collecting, the cardinality of those metrics. In other words, how many um, uh, bits of information am I going to get back from that particular metric? if I'm um, checking for it. And then what does that particular metric do? What does it measure? Be specific about what it's doing so that you can understand uh, what the metric is doing and whether it's important to you or not. Um, the other thing that I would add to this is to make sure that you're using labels. Um, some people call these instance labels. Some people call them target labels. Uh, both are important. Uh, instance labels would be things about the particular application itself. Uh, uh, some singular feature that's important. And a target label would be something more generic, like uh, what region that application is running in, or is this production or development? And that can help you later when you go into analyze your metrics, you'll be able to narrow down your focus on just the environment that's important for you, your particular DevOps team. And so using labels uh, in this way, adding labels to your uh, uh, exporter definition is really important so that you can go back later and save a lot of time so that you're not uh, confusing things in your environment. Make sure you're looking at the right entity when you go, if you do have a problem and you're trying to figure out what's going on. Another thing that's um, important is alerting. So what typically happens in these environments is that when you get started using exporters, it opens up the possibility for alerting on a lot of interesting data that's coming in through these Prometheus exporters. And what we always encourage people to do is use the golden signal methodology that was put forward uh, in lots of places, but in part in the Google SRE handbook to try to get a, a handle on, you know, if I've got 10,000 different metrics coming in, which ones are important and what's the threshold for something that should be considered uh, something I need to go look into that might be a service level indicator, for example. Um, or something that just happens all the time and, and isn't really a problem. So being able to take a look at uh, these four things, traffic, latency, errors, and saturation, um, and setting alerts on those as opposed to any, you know, any random type of uh, signal that's happening in your environment. A good example that I came across recently that you might wanna check out is Awesome Prometheus Alerts. Um, and you can find the URL at the bottom of the page there. If you're new to setting alerts in Prometheus, this is a great way to actually go in and get some examples to see uh, what other people are doing, what other people have suggested is important to alert on for a given environment. So I'd highly recommend you, if you're new especially, or even if, if, if you're not new, take a look at that page because there's a lot of really great examples that may be an eye opener and to something that you should be taking a look at or setting an alert on that, that you're not currently. Um, I also mentioned setting alerts that are actionable. And, and what does that mean? Well, uh, if you've been in a support role at any given point in time, you've probably had more than one instance where you had an alert storm, um, or you just had so many alerts coming in so frequently on a given topic 
that you start ignoring them. Oh, it's just another alert uh, for you know XYZ application. It happens all the time. I'm not going to take a look. And what you might not know is that that one time that it comes in is actually something that's impacting customers or revenue. So you really should pay attention to it. So this is an important topic. Um, also important, we talked about golden signals, but also important is to be able to alert on symptoms and not causes. So for example, you may have a situation where there's a CPU spike or high CPU uh, happening on your system. Well, that could be important to know. What's even more important is what's causing that particular high CPU load in your environment. So this is where Prometheus exporters can really play a big part in understanding all those various metrics for a particular application and which one is going beyond normal to cause that CPU problem. And that will certainly help reduce the amount of time it takes to go in and fix that particular problem as well. So this is an interesting one uh, as far as the best practice goes, but it should be intuitive to people that work in larger organizations or efficient smaller organizations, which is enable your teams. Um, doing things like creating dashboard templates uh, to share with your team so that when a new person comes on board and they're asked to create a dashboard for their particular application, they have an example to go look at of something that's been done previous so they, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, one of the things that we do within Sysdig is we take the feedback we get from our customers and we're always creating new dashboard templates in the product that are based on that real world, real, 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 real world example um, that, uh, for example, here you can see the Kubernetes node overview, for example. Uh, what we did was we went out to customers, we looked at what they were monitoring and why they were monitoring it, and then we created a template so that any users of Sysdig, once they get the agent installed, can go ahead and pull this up and take a look at this information. And if I was a new user of Kubernetes, maybe I was new to a team, uh, or maybe I was a developer that didn't have to work in ops necessarily all the time, but uh, I did want to understand, take a look at that dashboard and understand what it means. This can be incredibly useful and time-saving. Um, you can see some of the information that we put in is not only just having a template itself, but also explaining, for example, in a text field, just like you would if you were coding in a comment, you would use a comment to explain what, what this is, what's going on, so that other people that can come after you and take a look at it. We do the same thing at Sysdig and we encourage everyone to do that in the templates if they're creating a template for their team. Um, also, uh, a best practice that we're seeing more and more of from our customers is, is using Git to store configs um, as a repository for configs and not just for code. So uh, in doing that, you can enable your team to take part in a safe way uh, and edit uh, configurations, have them visible for everybody, but also have them be able to edit and make changes and have those changes reviewed before they're implemented. And then it also is just an easy place to go and find uh, the config that you need when you're setting up the architecture for your particular workload. You wanna go deploy a Prometheus exporter, for example. Um, it would be great to have your particular configuration information stored in Git where it can be changed in a responsible way over time. So enterprise ready access controls is another way to uh, both enable a team or not enable a team as the case may be. And there may be some circumstances where you want to do that. So for example, you may have a team that uh, just for sake of efficiency only needs to see their particular environment. They don't need the kitchen sink approach. They just need to see the applications uh, and um, infrastructure that's particular to them and what they're working on. And so one of the tools we'd have at Sysdig is the ability to tie in uh, RBAC uh, access controls into SSO and LDAP and things so that an administrator of a monitoring platform can come in and say, look, this is the uh, payments team, for example. They really only need to see payment stuff um, by default. And that way they're not worried about, you know, when they go to look up a problem, are they getting mixed signals because of other things that they're able to see? Um, they can really fine tune it down to their particular environment. The other thing that may come in is of course, uh, compliance regulations, things like that, where if you're managing a shopping application, credit card information flowing in or sensitive information, you obviously need to be able to control who sees that information. And so by having a uh, system in, uh, in place that can actually limit the, um, uh, the data that uh, uh, various teams can see, 
um, is really, really important, especially as you start deploying more and more of these Prometheus exporters in your environment that are pulling in all sorts of information that may or may not be appropriate for people to see. Now let's talk a little bit about the, the last best practice, which is have a plan for scale. Why do you need to have a plan for scale? Well, uh, in, in, in way of telling this, uh, I'll, I'll use a story uh, methodology here or a typical journey that you might take as you're deploying Prometheus and Prometheus exporters. Typically the way that most development teams or DevOps teams start out uh, is, you know, they first, they stand up an environment on Kubernetes need to find a way to monitor it. They have a little dev environment, so they put Prometheus out there and it's, it works pretty well. They get Prometheus installed. Um, perhaps they install Grafana, they get a dashboard up and working right away. Everybody's happy in the dev environment. And at, then at some point they make a decision to, after it's been running and tested and they're not having any issues, uh, it's running so well they want to roll that out into maybe a test environment uh, or a prod environment eventually. And, and things are working great. The only issue is that you start having a little bit of um, uh, distinction between these environments. So now instead of just having one uh, browser window up to go to my Grafana for my dev environment, uh, you know, I'm, if I'm a, certainly if I'm a, uh, an SRE or an ops person, I'm gonna have to have uh, two or three of these up uh, at the same time so that I can go take a look at these different environments. And so now I'm switching back and forth don't necessarily have all the data in one place. Uh, so it could be a little bit confusing, um, but things are still working fine at this point. Um, and, and then you start rolling this out in a much bigger way. And, and this is where some of the questions typically creep in. Uh, for example, what are you gonna do with data retention? When you're uh, installing Prometheus exporters, they can expose you know, tens of thousands of um, time series in your environment. Um, it varies based on the exporter that you're using and the environment that you're monitoring. Um, but there can be a lot of data coming in and it can be difficult to store. Uh, certainly it can be difficult to store for long term. Um, another thing is how do you scale that? How do you keep your Prometheus instance from uh, becoming too large if that's a concern for you or running out of space or uh, various other things? Um, I mentioned unified query before, the ability to take those, you know, dev prod user acceptance, scale that up by 10X or 20X or 100X, how do I then start to manage um, having all of that data in one place? Um, and how does this affect my workflow? Is my workflow becoming more efficient or less efficient as I scale up my Prometheus environment? Um, and so one of the ways that you can try to deal with this is by centralizing Grafana. So you can have one Grafana instance or maybe a few Grafana instances that are collecting all this data from your Prometheus uh, monitoring systems. That will certainly cut down on um, uh, the, uh, the confusion, but you still have an issue of how to store all that data. So the way that Prometheus typically scales um, is uh, vertically, but not necessarily horizontally. So the way that you want this to scale uh, in this kitten example is you start out with one uh, Prometheus server, you want it to scale in the same way every time um, horizontally and you want all of those instances to be able to talk to each other and look the same. But what actually happens in practice is uh, not that. You have a bunch of different cats running around different colors. Um, and over time, the configurations start to drift for that particular workload in that particular environment. Some of them have plenty of uh, storage available to them to store all these metrics for long-term. Some of them don't. You may start running into memory issues, um, which has always been a, a long-time concern for the Prometheus team. They've done some great work on being able to scale memory, for example, but you still end up having these um, different systems and it can be confusing when you have lots of different cats running around, so to speak. Uh, one way we try to solve this at Sysdig is by uh, our backend is actually fully Prometheus compatible. So you can point your uh, Prometheus exporters, for example, if you will, at, the, at our backend. Our agent will automatically scrape them and pull them in um, along with other metrics like system metrics, network metrics, uh, metrics about your Kubernetes environment, StatsD, JMX, custom metrics, et cetera. Um, so we'll pull those in and we are able to provide a much larger storage than typically you would be able to do with a typical Prometheus um, environment. So you can consolidate all of those on our backend 
And then because we're compatible with Prometheus, you can use PromQL, for example, the same way you normally would in a Grafana dashboard or in ARM dashboards in Sysdig Monitor. You can export, uh, if you have an alert uh, that uh, triggers, for example, you can export that information into PagerDuty or Slack. Um, it just provides a, a paid supported way to scale Prometheus in your environment if you're at that point where you're experiencing some of those pains I mentioned before. So let's take a look at some resources real quick. And then I wanna to get to some questions if there are any. And if there's still a little bit of time, I'll show you some examples of what this looks like, at least from a Sysdig perspective. One of the things that I would mention if you are interested in following along with the development of Prometheus or the development of Prometheus integrations and how to deploy them is to take a look at sysdig.com slash blog. So there's a number of, uh, there's a number, there's a blog post that comes out, you know, almost daily about something about Prometheus monitoring, something about Kubernetes monitoring. Uh, we also have a secure product. So lots of information right now going back and forth about um, how to secure Kubernetes environments, um, how to scan your images and that type of thing. So if you're interested um, in this space and would like a kind of a, a regular update on what's going on. I'd highly recommend checking out the blog. I mentioned PromCat already, so I won't do that again, but there's also a Kubernetes monitoring guide that uh, is uh, available in the resources section on sysdig.com. It's about a 50 page guide, I think, and uh, it goes into everything about Kubernetes that you need to know. What is Kubernetes? What is the control plane? What are good alerts? What's the best practices around monitoring Kubernetes? What are some examples of, of uh, deployments that you can uh, pick up and use right away. So if you're new to Kubernetes or you just want to learn more, I would highly recommend going and checking out that guide. And just as a sneak peek, we'll be deploying an, an updated Prometheus monitoring guide as well uh, in the coming uh, month, probably in November. So be on the lookout for that resource as well. Uh, you can also sign up for a free trial, just a, just a, uh, a plug here for the Sysdig product. Um, you can see some of these things in action. You can get a free 30-day trial. So uh, just a plug, if you want to try it out, there's no cost involved. Uh, pick an environment, install the agent. Maybe it's a dev environment. Install the agent and see if there's value that you get out of running Sysdig Monitor or Sysdig Secure in your environment. And you can see some of the things that I mentioned before actually in practice in your own environment. It's a great way to check out the tool and see if it would be of use to you. Uh, and also just a plug for our webinars here. There's some good ones coming up. The Cards Against Containers, if you're familiar with Cards Against Humanity, uh, we developed a game called Cards Against Containers and we'll be donating to Feeding America for those people that attend. So the more people that attend, the more that Sysdig will donate to Feeding America. So go to sysdig.webinars and check these out and definitely sign up for Cards Against Containers. It's a really fun game if you haven't played it. Um, and it's kind of fun to see what it looks like when you put Cards Against Humanity uh, into a container paradigm, uh, what you can come up with. It's pretty funny. So I'm gonna pause there and see if there's any questions um, that I can answer quickly on the line. And then I will um, uh, jump into a, a quick demo. But first, let's see if there's any questions. I'm not seeing any questions at this point. So let me show you, in that case, let me show you some of the things that are in, um, let me pull up my chat here. Oh yeah, I think I mentioned the first one. So these questions are coming in in chat. Um, uh, are there best practices related to where, where to host a Prometheus scraper? Some people seem to advise using two servers and combining data later, which actually you can do. Um, there are techniques for federation if you want to do that, but that also creates some problems down the road. So just be, be careful uh, with scaling when you're federating. Um, it can cause some confusion if you're, if you're not careful um, and don't have the right metadata into which uh, set of metrics you're actually looking at. So let's go ahead. I'll switch gears real quick and bring up my uh, demo environment and just show you what this actually looks like. Here we go. Hopefully you can see that. So this is PromCat. This is the resource I mentioned um, 
that we're cataloging or curating all of these uh, exporters or as many as we can. Um, this is something we just started six months ago and we're getting a lot of great feedback on it. If you look down here, there's a lot of different exporters that we want to add uh, in the near future, but we've been rolling out um, on average one or two exporters a week. Um, and so if you click on available here, you can narrow down to just the exporters that are available right now. You can see we've been doing a lot of work on AWS lately. So cloud service exporters to be able to monitor uh, data coming in from CloudWatch and other environments in AWS um, is where we've been focusing a lot of our time over the past few months. Uh, if we take a look at one of these exporters, just by clicking on it, I'll show you what I was talking about before. Uh, we include a description of uh, things that are important to know about Lambda monitoring, for example. Um, we include a setup guide, pretty detailed setup guide, actually. So even beyond the exporter itself, things like making sure that you're creating uh, an AWS IAM policy and how to do that in your environment, uh, setting up the credentials. Uh, if you're running the Sysdig agent, things that you need to know about, uh, specific things around setting up the Sysdig agent to do the scraping. And then uh, we give you example files that you can download. And you can see we list the um, example YAML that you're gonna need for, um, for your environment. So you can pick this up. It's a great shortcut for people that are going through this. Of course, your credentials are gonna be different. There's some environment variables here that are going to change based on the names in your environment. Uh, but we give you this so that you can go have a place to start at least so that you don't have to come up with this from scratch. Uh, the other thing we offer are dashboards. And we offer these dashboards in most cases for the our Sysdig Monitor product where I'll give you, I'll show you what that looks like in a minute, but also for Grafana because we have a lot of customers that just run Grafana. They like to run it. Uh, they're used to that tool. And so we have no problem being uh, fully Prometheus compatible in uh, people using uh, Grafana if they choose to. And then some sample alerts that you might be uh, interested in or things that you might wanna consider. I mentioned the alerting methodologies before uh, trying to figure out what's important. We do some of that heavy lifting for you, but we can't do it all because every environment is different. So that's PromCat. Let me show you what this looks like when, once you implement it. Um, this is the Sysdig Monitor product. And what we're looking at here is the AWS, uh, AWS Lambda dashboard that came in from, that was imported from that page I just showed you before. And you can see that we're using some golden signals methodology here, looking at things like uh, error rates, looking at things like um, throughput in terms of uh, invocations and duration. Again, those terms differ depending on the environment that you're looking at. Um, but understanding those golden signals that are important to you and then being able to track um, you can see here that we had multiple invocations happening at 11.30. By the way, as I move this around, you'll notice that that um, uh, indicator also moves on all of the other graphs so that you can see what's going on. But you can see here at 11.30, um, if you look down here at duration, we had a uh, this particular function. This is just one function. You could have many on here, uh, but this particular function had some long running invocations. Um, so not only the number of invocation, invocations, but how long did they run on average or what was the maximum runtime for that particular uh, function. And that's important because obviously the longer your functions run, the higher your uh, uh, Lambda bill is gonna be as part of your AWS bill. So that's important to take a look at. Um, in terms of those templates I mentioned before and having a, having a curated view of the world that is easy for you to understand, uh, this is an example of our overview page for clusters in your environment where we stack rank these depending on the number of events that you have, show you the events that, that are related to those particular environments, and then allow you to drill down easily into uh, various parts of the cluster. And you'll notice on top here that we pull in the scope as well, the scope of what you're looking at, we maintain that. So as you drill down in here onto some suspect environments that you might wanna troubleshoot, take a look at the workloads, for example, you'll see that this scope uh, that we're looking at is pulled as well uh, into, uh, as we go further and further down the uh, rabbit hole, so to speak. If we take a look at the, co the uh, Kubernetes pod overview, this is a template, as I mentioned before. Again, we've inherited all that scope. This is JKE cluster, uh, sorry, GKE cluster. It's the sock shop namespace. It's the cart DB uh, workload. So this is some sort of a, um, a database environment for uh, processing the, um, 
uh, the, the orders we're taking in for new and interesting socks, I guess. But um, you can see here that uh, even though this is a template, it's showing us valuable information like uh, what, what are workload resources and which ones should I be paying attention to? And then from here, I can customize this dashboard to my heart's content. And again, looking at some of the other templates that we have in here, uh, things like gold, uh, uh, golden signals for um, Kubernetes service, for example. Again, looking at things like response time, looking at things like error rates, those golden signals um, that should guide your, or help you get more meaningful, uh, set more meaningful alerts in your environment and get more meaningful data out of your Prometheus exporters or just out of, in this case, your Kubernetes environment. Um, you can see how that becomes very, very important over time uh, to narrow down on, on what's important in your environment. So those are just a few examples of how you might um, take a Prometheus exporter, uh, uh, deploy it, and then get the information out of it in a quick and easy way without having to spend so much time on maintenance. Uh, because that really is uh, the big killer here when there's hundreds of Prometheus exporters potentially that you need to evaluate, deploy, and maintain. Um, having a good methodology and best practices around doing that is gonna save you a lot of time and a lot of pain at the end of the day. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and just see if there's any more uh, questions out there. I'm looking at the Q&A and I don't see, and the chat, and I don't see any more questions. So um, with that, I'm going to thank everybody for joining, I guess, but I'll hang out and just in case there's more questions uh, that you have. or if there's any discussion, maybe you don't have a question, but you took issue with something I said. <laughs> That's always a dangerous thing to open it up to. I think there's a there's the possibility if you bring it up in Q&A that we can unmute your line and have a discussion. Uh, we, we, one of the questions that came up uh, last time I actually did this presentation was around PromQL. I mentioned that we support PromQL. Um, we support PromQL in the dashboards and in our alerts. Um, and you can, of course, query from your end if you have a, uh, by using the standard API method, you can query our backend for information about your environment. So if you have a script running on a host that's using PromQL to pull information to make some determination, you can do that. Um, and you can configure panels in our dashboard by using PromQL or by using a form-based methodology where you click and choose which, um, which information you want to see. So you can choose. If you don't know PromQL, you're not locked into PromQL. You can actually use our form-based method and get the same information that way. So just FYI, that was something that I didn't make clear in the last time I presented this. Uh, there is a question from Alejandro. He says... Uh, uh, in security mo monitoring, have you seen companies using Prometheus? Yes, absolutely. Um, the two kind of go hand in hand. So we have uh, lots of companies, big companies, that are using Prometheus and also doing um, security monitoring as well. Um, many times with security monitoring, what you're looking at are things like the Falco rules. Falco is an open source project that we contributed to the CNCF and it's rules for, um, uh, for your environment that uh, you can set up and make sure aren't being violated. And um, so the community can jump in and create new rules. Or once, you've, once you have those rules available to you, you can modify them to your heart's content. So not necessarily Prometheus, but certainly having another open source project like Falco that can help you secure your environment is very important. And uh, we fully support that, obviously, in our secure product. So take a look at that. Um, sign up for a trial and see if you can turn on some image scanning and get some interesting information. That's always what happens when people try the secure product is they say, well, I didn't know that I was uh, um, out of date or I had a vulnerable package in, in my container image. Um, and you can quickly go in and fix those things. So uh, check that out as well. Any other questions? All right, so I, I'm gonna wrap it up and just I say, I hope everybody stays safe. Um, 
Ah, here's another question. I knew if I waited, there would be another one that came in. How does one contribute to the Prometheus configurations catalog? Um, the way that you contribute is by contributing to the open source projects themselves. So again, the catalog is something that we're doing at Sysdig um, to um, uh, to kind of have a to kind of narrow down on the the uh, Prometheus exporters that we feel are most important and that our customers tell us are most important. So that's the other way that you can contribute is by uh, letting us know which ones you think are are best and um, why they're working for you or or if we've missed one or if you say hey look you know you've rolled out 30 um, exporters on Promcat but you don't have XYZ exporter, and I really need that for my environment. Let us know, because the more that we hear from you, uh, the more focus will be put on, uh, by our team that manages that um, and does all the testing and maintenance of uh, the exporters that live on PromCat. They will take that into account and go focus on that particular exporter that you need. So let us know if you want to see a new one. Um, and if there's one that you think could be better, should be better, definitely go to the GitHub page for that exporter and um, see if you can contribute in some way by helping test issues, uh, improve the documentation, et cetera. We don't take anything from the community and host it ourselves and claim that we own it. Uh, we always give it back. So we link to those projects and we're helping augment those projects, certainly not take over anything. Okay, I think I'm gonna wrap it up there. Again, as I was saying, just I hope everybody stays safe. Uh, out there and thanks for joining. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to me directly at Sysdig.